lawmakers in Columbia are tackling a lot of issues at the South Carolina State House, from tackling the budget to paying teachers more. I talk one-on-one -on -one with State Representative Russell Ott of House District 93, Lexington, Orangeburg, and Calhoun Counties for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close Ups on Facebook. State Representative Russell Ott, welcome back to Quentin's Close Ups. Thanks for having me, Quentin. It's always good to be with you. Oh, I appreciate it greatly. You know, you are the state representative for House District 93, which now includes Orangeburg, Calhoun, and I believe parts of Lexington County. That's right. Yep. Yeah, you know, it got changed up during redistricting. Um, I've always had those three counties, always had all of Calhoun County. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, some of Lexington, the, the part that really changed was in Orangeburg County. Mm. So um, representing some new folks over there now. And uh, getting to know them and figuring out what their needs and concerns are. So it's been good. I've enjoyed it. I'm, uh, I'm sure you have. And so what are their concerns and needs right now for Orangeburg County? Yeah, you know, I think I think it's very similar. I mean, to, to the rest of the state. I think at the end of the day, you know, we, we do get uh, kind of wrapped around the axle on, on a lot of different issues from year to year. But at the end of the day, what I feel like is always consistent. Folks want to be safe. They want security, you know, they want to, they want to be able to go home and, and feel like, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about crime. Uh, they care about public education. They want to be able to go and, and get a job and, and have a high paying job like you and I were just talking about and, and be able to pay a mortgage, um, support their families. Those are the things I think at the end of the day, people really care about. They want to be able to ride up and down safe roads, right? You know, they want to. They want to know ultimately that their tax dollars are being used in a good way and, and that they can tangibly feel, you know, what what their what their tax dollars are ultimately going to. So, um, you know, trying to just create opportunities. That's the bottom line, trying to attract economic development to the region and the area. We've been able to do that, um, you know, and, and hopefully that will continue. But a whole host of issues, you know, there's never a shortage of issues around this place for sure. Um, and we're down to the short roads. We're down to three weeks left in the session. Huh. So hopefully we're going to be able to finish strong. Wow. So let me ask you, in Orangeburg County, State Representative, where are the tax dollars actually being used at? Yeah, you know, we've, we've had some really great things that have transpired recently. Um, you know, one of the biggest ones for Orangeburg specifically and Calhoun County was the merger of the regional medical center and the medical university of south carolina so uh, i certainly think that that is going to be really trans transformational for our area i mean you know we are so dependent upon the the, the hospital um and to lose it you know would be devastating for, for orangeburg and calhoun and, and we've seen so many small rural hospitals across the entire country that have closed recently so you know by and, and 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 honestly the regional medical center was operating at a at a pretty large deficit so to bring in the resources of the medical university of south carolina which is a state-owned um state-owned institution uh be able to you know bring in their purchasing power uh the research aspect of it that's going to go along with it that the, the very high level high class of Physicians is just going to be a really big deal. So really excited about that. Um, you know, they, they passed the bond referendum right. to build some new schools in Orangeburg County. Um, so that has been a big deal. And we have been very aggressive on attracting economic develop economic development in Orangeburg and really excited about the, the scout manufacturing facility that's going to be locating in Richland County. You know, that's going to be huge for the entire Midlands region of South Carolina. So we're going to have a lot of spinoff business that is ultimately created, you know, from that also. So I'm uh, just excited. But at the same time, you know, Quentin, trying to manage that growth, mm. you know, that that's a big deal. Um, you know, you can get, I think, kind of, you can put blinders on and, and only think about more, more, more. And at the end of the day, you got to also balance that, I think, with trying to maintain the essence of what this region is all about. And, you know, try, I always try to balance that with, you know, what our number one industry in the state is, which is agriculture and Orangeburg and Calhoun or, and Lexington are huge agricultural communities. 
So, you know, it's, it's always a balance. And, and you've got to make sure, I think, that you look at things from multiple angles and, and not get in a rut of only trying to go after one one thing. Um, it, it, it does take, I think, you know, putting putting multiple lenses on it and trying to make sure that, you know, you're, you're addressing the needs and the wants and the desires of all of the citizens, not just a, a select group. So let me ask you this, Dan. How do you manage that growth with smart growth? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not always easy. You know what I mean? But I think at the end of the day, for me, it's just trying to make sure that you get diversity around a table and that you listen to the different voices that represent different segments of society. And, you know, I think that's just really important. At the end of the day, you can't do it unless you understand where people are coming from. And, and that just requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of time and requires a lot of effort to try to understand that. And then it's just trying to create that balance. Um, and, and I think we've done a good job of it. But at the end of the day, it's an ongoing issue. It's not something that you just do and then you sit down and walk away from. It takes constant effort um, to try to balance, you know, the different needs and wants of different people. So but, that's what, but that's what makes South Carolina and our country so great. Yes, you know, sir. <laughs> it is. It's just. It's not. It's not just. You know, one one group of people. It, it's diverse, and you know, to be able to address that diversity, it takes it takes work. So, what is your five point plan for diversity for Orangeburg, Calhoun, and Lexington counties? I don't know if it's a five point plan. You know what I mean? But again, I, and I and and that's the point I want to just continue to hammer on, Quentin. Is I don't think it's just for our area. I don't think it's just for our region. I mean, I, I think that, you know, as far as the, the entire state is concerned, you know, you, you've got to look at it through that spectrum and that lens. And, um, you know, it, it all for me comes back to education, trying to make sure that we get that right. You know, we have spent a lot of time this year in the general assembly on, on educational issues. Um, we're going to have a huge debate tomorrow in the general assembly in the house dealing with ESAs, which are educational savings accounts. It's a, it's a new spin on the, the whole voucher debate. That's, that's ultimately what it is, is, you know, sending public dollars to private schools. Very concerned about that. You know, I, I just think that it doesn't matter what community you're talking about in the state. It all comes back to education and, and trying to prepare the next generation to be part of the workforce. Um, give them the, the skills and the needs that are necessary to to be able to go out and get a job and provide for their families also. So for me, that's what it all comes back to. I mean, there's there's a lot of side issues that always matter, but um, public edu education is big and, and we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And, and I know, you know, the whole notion of choice sounds very attractive to a lot of people. I mean, I love it. Who doesn't want choice? in their life, in their lives. But at the end of the day, you know, we've got to remember everyone. We've got to, we've got to craft policy that makes sense for everyone, not just a select few, not just those who have the ability maybe to have the trans transportation to get to a school that they would like to go to. What about the ones that don't? And so that's why I've just always been a big advocate of focusing on improving public education. And it's not great, I, you know, and, and what I have a hard time doing, a lot of us that are extremely pro public education, you know, we come across as supporting status quo. And, and really, that's not what we want. With no one, you know, no one that, that, that I fight with every day in the trenches for public education are saying that we've got great public education in South Carolina. We've got some major problems. I, I just wish that we didn't spend so much time focusing on sending public dollars and resources to those private institutions. I wish that we could focus all of our energy and our efforts on improving our public education, our public schools across the state. If we do that, then my argument is, what's the need for sending a kid or sending your child to private school if you've got fantastic public schools as an option? I, I, I want to get to that in just a second, and about this private school choice bill. But let me tell, let me ask you this, state representative: What are the public education problems right now in Orangeburg, Calhoun, and, and Lexington counties? Yeah, well, we've dealt with a lot of you know infrastructure 
concerns. I mean, we've got some very old schools, um, and, and I think that's why the bond referendum is, is so big for Orangeburg County and trying to update those schools. At the end of the day, we, we have had unprecedented levels of losing teachers across the state. And so we, we worked really hard and, and we've been putting a lot of money in, into those teacher salaries, trying to get that starting salary up. Um, and, and we've made some great strides there, but it's not just about the pay. You know what I mean? We, we've got to get uh, respect for teachers reinstituted. Um, you know, I, I hear from so many teachers that their classroom sizes are so large that they spend their days trying to manage the, class, manage the classroom rather than actually teaching the students. And so that's a problem. So, you know, it's not just, I don't think it's a regional issue. I mean, you know, we have differences based off of our geographics, but at the end of the day, a lot of the concerns, a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve, um, you know, relate to the entire state, not just a particular region. So how many teachers in Calhoun and Orangeburg and Lexington counties have you all lost over the past two years? You know, I, I don't know an exact number, Quentin. Um, and, and we have, you know, we've been able to, to I think, manage it. Um, you know, I, I think that Calhoun County particularly have done some very good things as far as incentives with, with teachers. You know, they, they have definitely dipped into their reserve accounts to try to get bonuses to attract teachers, to make, you know, to retain teachers and to attract new teachers. But it's a revolving door. And, um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's ongoing, but, but I'm really proud and, and, you know, there have been gains. Um, and, and that's, you know, when you, when you talk about education, a lot of people just want to talk about test scores. There's a lot more to it that goes into whether a kid is, is having their needs met than just test scores. And so I'm, I'm really proud of some of the efforts that we've made over the, the course of the last few years to get away from that standardized testing as simply the, the mechanism by which we judge our schools and our teachers. Um, so, you know, we're continuing to fight the good fight. Um, and, and I'm really proud of not just Lexington, not just Orangeburg and Calhoun, but Lexington, uh, Lexington 4 as well, which is an area that I represent, which is Swansea and Gaston, doing some really great things, have some great superintendents there um, that, that are really doing some transformational things, and I'm really proud of them. So how many teachers were retained in those three counties? Uh, as well, I mean, the retention, you know, again, as, as far as retention is concerned, the teachers that have, have decided to stick it out, I mean, we have lost teachers. So it's, it's not about the number that have, you know, been retained. I'm more focused on the ones that are leaving and why are they leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, there's a whole host of issues. But at the end of the day, you know, they're doing – they're doing a, a yeoman's job of, of, you know, educating the kids with what they have. But I really do believe that, you know, the, the budgetary changes that we've made and trying to, to, to attract new teachers, that at the end of the day, but, it, you know, I, we could go on and on. It, what's frustrating to me is a lot of times when you talk about education, teachers, law enforcement officers, you know, some of these professions, Quentin, that are the most important in society. Like I said, keeping people safe, educating our, our next next generation, you know, the things that really, really matter, a lot of times those aren't our highest paying jobs. And so, you know, you, you have a situation where our, our best and our brightest are going to college and they're choosing fields where they obviously can be very successful and make the most money. And we've got to figure out ways to attract them to go in those high need areas, you know, whether it's whether it's law enforcement, sheriff's deputies or, or teachers. Um, if, if we want the best, then we're going to have to be willing to um, attract them through, you know, economic way. We've got to be able to pay them um, salaries that are going to make them want to go into those fields. And quickly, in those three counties that you represent, what are the highest need areas right now? The highest needs for the three areas or just when it comes to education? Oh, well, right now, as far as, uh, well, you can include education as well. In general? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I think that probably our, our biggest need right now revolves around, in rural areas in general, I think our biggest need revolves around jobs. Um, you know, there's been study after study that have shown that our new jobs are certainly our new industry 
is locating in in more urban areas across the state. And so, you know, we, we had, and that's why you've seen, that's why it was so interesting, I think, with the redistrict, redistricting that took place about a year and a half ago. I mean, our rural areas are continuing to shrink in population and our urban areas are continuing to grow. And I think that's a direct correlation and result of number one, schools, resources, and number two, job opportunities. And so we've got to figure out a way to get, you know, job opportunities into those rural areas. But we've got to figure out why the folks that are living in the rural areas of working age are not taking jobs that are there. And a lot of that goes back, Quentin, to transportation needs. Um, and it also goes back to child care needs. Um, and both of which, you know, make it very hard on 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 folks that are trying to get that job and they're trying to balance, well, I don't have anywhere that I can afford to send my kid. So what do I do? And, and so what you end up having is a lot of those folks financially just simply have to stay home, not take jobs that are available to them because they can't afford the daycare if they can even find a daycare. So I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing in the house. You know, Speaker Smith uh, convened a, a special committee that I was honored to be put on um, over the interim, and we've been working throughout. We actually have a meeting today at 10 o'clock um, that's really studying all of those issues, trying to figure out, you know, what can we do to get folks that are of working age into the workforce? And, you know, so we've got some really great ideas that we're hoping to put into practicality and, and to put into place by developing good, smart plans, by by doing away with a lot of the redundancy that exists across the state and state government. I and mean, we've got a lot of different small groups that are trying to do the same thing, but there's really no cohesion. Mm -hmm. And so we are really interested in trying to put that under one umbrella, task and charge one group of individuals, one agency with trying to make sure that if you are an unemployed individual in the state of South Carolina and you are looking for a job, that you don't feel like it's overwhelming and you don't know where to go. We want to make it very easy. We want to tell you where to go to find what those job opportunities are. If you need child care, we want to be able to get you the information on where you can send your child. If it's a transportation issue, we want to be able to get you to the people that you need to be with to know how you can get transportation to and from work. So I'm um, really glad that we're starting to focus on that. And, and you know, if, if we're going to be successful, those are the types of issues that we're going to have to get solutions for. Now, I know you have to wrap it up because it's right now 920. But let me ask you this. What are the last figures of population for District 93? Like I said, they it, it declined. So in other words, we lost, I think District 93 lost a few thousand um, folks. Again, you know, and, and again, you know, that's up for debate, Quentin. You know, uh, a lot of folks don't think that we did a great job in South Carolina as far as the last census was concerned. Um, but nevertheless, you know, based off of the folks that did respond, District 93 lost population, which, which required that district to grow in geographical size to pick up additional voters. Um, so again, there's pockets that have showed growth, particularly around Columbia, oh, yes. you know, so we, there was growth there, but w the further you got away from Columbia, that was where the, the largest decreases in population w were actually seen and overall it, it lost population. So it had to grow, but certainly hoping, you know, and, and, and again, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing. It just means that that is challenges that are going to have to be overcome. Uh, you know, a lot of folks that live out in the rural parts love living in the rural parts of South Carolina because they don't want to be around a lot of other people. And so that's, you know, again, I'm not saying that we have to reverse that trend and we've got to get population growth into those areas, but it is good to know what you're dealing with. And we've got to make sure that folks that live out in the country don't get left out when it comes to policy that we are trying to enact here in Columbia. And what other policies do you want to enact right now? You know, again, just trying to make sure that they have the things they need. Number one, you know, we want to make sure the public education is good. We want them to have jobs. We want to make sure that we focus on improving the road system in those rural areas. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've got a system where we, we and, and it's not necessarily wrong, you know, we, we prioritize roads based off of the number of cars that are going up and down them. But if you live out in the country and you might, you know, have to traverse a road each and every day, 
that hasn't had any attention for decades. There might not be a lot of cars, but for the ones that are on there, you know, it's it's, it's terrible. And so we've got to, again, it's, it, you know, I keep using the word balance, Quentin, but at the end of the day, that's what it's all about is trying to find those balances between, you know, what different groups of individuals want and desire. So quickly, what 10 year plan would you submit to the Department of Transportation to correct the backlog of maintenance and actually thick roads in 93? Yeah, well, let me say, I think the Department of Transportation is doing a great job. You know, they, they catch a lot of flack, and I, but I do think that they are doing a fantastic job with what they have to work with. And, and the money is there. Hmm. You know, resources are there. I, you know, I continue to say that when we did the, the hard work years ago to increase the gas tax, that, that was not easy. You know, no one likes to go up on taxes for anyone, um, but it was necessary. We had kicked that can down the road for so long and we allowed our, our entire system to, to fall into such a state of disrepair that it's going to take a long time for us to, to dig our way out of that, but we're doing it. So I'm very proud of the work the DOT is doing. Um, we need some more contractors. You know, at the end of the day, you can have the resources and the money, but if you only have so many contractors available to do the work, well, then that's an issue. And, and you know, I think that we've got some fantastic contractors that are that are working very hard, but you know, it's just not going to be something that we turn around in, in a matter of a few years. It's going to have to be a sustained effort to, to get our roads back to where they need to be. But we're getting there. And I'm very proud of that work. We've got to continue also on our maintenance, um, you know, of, of our infrastructure, you know, our, our drainage systems, our ditch systems. That's a big deal for us out in the country, you know, and, and trying to make sure that ditches are cleared and cleaned. Um, and, and that just takes a lot of resources also. But doing a good job overall. Overall, so let me ask you this quickly: uh, How would you create a p permanent funding source for maintenance and road capacity in your district? Well, we have that. I mean, okay. you know, we, we've got that with gas tax. Okay, uh, but that does bring up another issue. You know, we're gonna we're gonna see a huge shift to um, EV cars and, and trucks and vehicles over over the next couple of decades, and we still don't know how we want to get the revenue from those those vehicles that will also be using our roads. When they go and, and, and get their electricity um, from a charging station, we don't have a plan on how we're going to make sure that they are included in contributing to our road and maintenance fund. And that's something that we kind of kind of put off for longer than we should have. And so look forward to working on that issue also, which is, you know, how do we want to, you know, we, we charge traditional vehicles by the number of gallons of gasoline that they purchase. So we've got the gas tax, but we don't have a, a similar tax on the electricity that is purchased right now for EV cars. What would be ideal for that as far as That's tax? A great question. There's a lot of different, you know, a lot of, a lot of different ideas out there about how that should be done. Hours of usage is one of them to try to just figure out how many hours, you know, the, the, the car is run and, and then charged based off of that kilowatt hours. Um, there's a whole host of ways that different states are doing it. And that's what we're doing is taking a look at how other states are doing it right now and try to figure out what, what works best for us. And I want to continue this conversation at another time, but state representative Russell Art, thank you for your time. And again, welcome we, back we, to School Subs. <laughs> we we talk about the horse racing, Quentin. We'll have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Take Absolutely. care, man. I appreciate you. Likewise.